<laughs> that was good. Was that okay. our uh, starting call? Yeah, that was a call. Okay, um, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're uh, living right now. I want to uh, welcome everybody to Barnard College Art History Department and to my seminar, uh, Making Visual a Tale of Two Cities. It's a seminar that I developed with Frame Kisner Murphy and Emily Smith. And we are really looking at and creatively researching ways in which our virtual times can be an asset instead of uh, a fallback. Um, and this uh, presentation today by my colleague, also part of the Barnard Art History Department, but he is currently in Berlin, John Miller, is part of our investigation. And we're really pleased to present this uh, conversation. It's something that could have perhaps been done on campus and in person, but we probably would not have gotten the 65 RSVPs in the same way that we are getting virtual. So I am really looking forward to hearing it. So John, do you wanna take over now? Sure, yeah, thanks a lot, Joan. Yeah. Um, yeah, so today we'll uh, have a discussion about Mike Kelly's work uh, titled, uh, well, the panel title is Mike Kelly, Matter, Memory, and the Sublime. And uh, one uh, reason for having this is that um, Laura Lopez Paniagua's book on Mike Kelly, uh, which is um, called, um, Material Aesthetics and Memory Illusions is being probably printed as we speak. Although, if you know anything about printing, actually printing goes pretty quickly. So it's probably being bound as we speak, which is <laughs> a little less dramatic, but um, it, the book is coming out very soon. Um, and then joining us, uh, will be uh, two other uh, Mike Kelly scholars, um, Genevieve Loop, who's working on her dissertation on Mike Kelly's work at the University of Paris, and Francesca Verga, who's uh, working at, also on a PhD dissertation at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and um, I think what brings the work of these three scholars together, well, I, I think it represents a kind of new generation of inquiry into Mike Kelly's work. And um, they share common interests um, on, on at least three points. Uh, one is uh, the idea of materialism as a basis for aesthetics. Uh, second, uh, a look into the role of memory uh, as, as a theme that runs throughout Mike Kelly's work. And then also a kind of uh, redefinition of the sublime in terms of contemporary aesthetics. So what we're going to do um, this evening is start off with uh, each of the panelists, including me, um, speaking for about 10 minutes. Uh, and then um, we'll take a short break and then have a group discussion. But I, I figure by then we'll be about an hour into it. And, um, and then we'll have a discussion among the panelists and then open it up to anyone else who wants to chime in. Uh, so we'll start off with Laura. So Laura, take it away. Okay, John, thank you. So uh, first of all, thanks Joanne Snitzer and her class for inviting us today. And of course, thank you, John, for making it possible. And uh, thank you, everybody joining. Um, well, we all know at this point that uh, Zoom conferences can be very challenging, so I really appreciate the effort. And uh, yes, we had the idea of coming together uh, on the occasion of the publishing of the book that uh, John just mentioned, Mike Kelly, Materialist Aesthetics and Memory Illusions which is based on uh, my 2015 doctoral thesis, Memory in the Work of Mike Kelly. And uh, yes, it would be a great moment to show you the book, but the copies are arriving, not being bounded, they're arriving now. 
So um, I'm going to show you a slide uh, later and um, you have my word, the book exists. So uh, to transform the thesis into a book has been a long and challenging process. And uh, I just wanna take a second to thank many of the wonderful people involved uh, in bringing it to a good end. So first, thanks John for helping me with everything and for your beautiful introduction to the book. To Moose's uh, fantastic team, especially Ilaria Bombelli and Francesco Valtolina. To Angel Nieto for his super kind contribution that made the book possible. To uh, the amazing Mark So, uh, amazing copy editor. Of course, to the Mike Kelly Foundation for the Arts, who was very kind to us and uh, who helped us very much. Thank you, Mary Claire Stevens and Amy Baya. And of course, thank you to my beautiful family and friends, many of whom joined today. Thank you. So uh, I'm really glad that uh, John, Francesca, Genevieve and I uh, could come together to, to share this conversation because though our academic work has many common points, uh, our perspectives also differ. So as everybody knows, John wrote the first academic book focusing uh, on the educational complex, which is one of the most important artworks in uh, Mike Kelly's career. Uh, and Genevieve and Francesca are finishing their PhDs, uh, focusing uh, respectively in the sublime and memory. And my book is a comprehensive study of Mike Kelly's work as a whole, articulated through concepts like the sublime and memory. And I'm going to try to start a slideshow. We just tried it and I froze, so I hope this doesn't happen now. So let's see. Okay, do you see it? Yes. Am I frozen? No, not no. for the moment. All yes. right, good. So one word uh, about the perspective from which this book is written, because it's not uh, solely art historical. Uh, it's multi and transdisciplinary, and um, there's a reason for that. So Mike Kelly was always very worried that his work was being misinterpreted. And um, yes, he also worried about how history would remember him when he was no longer here to be able to defend his own positions. So um, I wanted to follow him and let him lead the way. And it is him who led me to anthropology and psychology, psychoanalysis, philosophy, etc. Uh, I never wanted to impose uh, my own framework of interpretation and I followed his. So I'm now going to address the basic argument of the book in three sentences. And uh, then I'll try to elaborate briefly on the most important points. It is very abstract, but just three sentences. So first, the thesis of the book is that through his artwork and his writings, Mike Kelly implicitly formulates a materialist notion of aesthetics, which opposes to the Western idealist tradition. Second, he puts forward this new materialist notion by reverting established categories like the sublime and memory. And third, this materialist notion of aesthetics is not only applicable to his work, but can be used as a theoretical framework to understand much of the work of his contemporaries as well. Okay, so first, materialist versus idealist aesthetics. What I'm going to explain is, of course, a very simplified form of this idea because it would take me very long to explain why the Western aesthetic tradition can be considered idealist and also to address properly why Kelly's notion opposes to it. So I've selected two visual examples that I hope are self-explanatory and that can give you an idea of what I'm aiming at. I, aiming at. So this is the Apollo Belvedere. And this is uh, one of the works of Mike Kelly's Arena series. So uh, I've chosen the Apollo Belvedere because it was considered the apex of beauty 
by neoclassical author Johann Winkelmann. And of course, Winkelmann is definitely one of the greatest proponents of idealism in art. In fact, in his uh, very famous book, Nach Amung der Griechischen Werke, he stated that the arts should follow the Greek canon because they put forward ideal beauties, brain-born images. Okay. So my Kelly's Arena series could exemplify materialist aesthetics in contrast to the Apollo Belvedere because what is represented is not an ideal either in formal, formal or ethical terms. It doesn't aim to embody any universal quality, but rather cultural meanings. Its materials are not exclusive, dignified and durable like marble, but cheap and common and tender. And it is not solemn and glorious, but ridiculous and funny. So you might think it's a joke and you're probably right, but it's very substantial. So again, I'm instantiating the Western aesthetic idealism in the Apollo Belvedere and Kelly's materialist aesthetic in the Arena series. All right, uh, I want to say that Kelly never form formulates this argument exactly like this, but this is something that I distill for, for instance, from texts like playing with dead things on the uncanny or foul perfection, thoughts on caricature where he does uh, address his rejection of the Western idealist tradition. So when I'm uh, using the term materialism, I'm using it like uh, Georges Bataille, for whom materialism, whatever its scope in the positive order, necessarily is above all the obstinate negation of idealism. Okay, so materialism is a negation of idealism. I think John will talk about this later. So um, then when I'm talking about this materialist notion of aesthetics as opposed to idealist aesthetics, I'm talking about a whole change of paradigm which affects all the parameters that define art. And Kelly addresses this change of paradigm through reverting established categories. For example, he writes profusely on the category of the sublime. All right, so this is what everybody has in mind when we refer to the sublime, which is the 19th century romantic notion. So to this, Kelly opposes his materialist or psychedelic sublime. So Kelly understands the romantic sublime like Barbara Novak, who was a professor here at Bernard. And I think Genevieve is going to talk about this later. So uh, Novak understands that in paintings like these, God and nature are the same. So the representation of nature is the representation of God. So the romantic sublime instantiated in this kind of painting is a transcendental experience it's a moment of contact with the plane of God, with another plane, with the plane of the ideal. And Kelly says, I quote, for me, psychedelia was sublime because in psychedelia, your worldview fell apart. That was a sublime revelation. That was my youth. And that was my notion of beauty. And that was a kind of cataclysmic sublime. It was very interiorized. It wasn't about a metaphysical outside. It was about your own consciousness. So opposed to the romantic sublime, the psychedelic sublime is not a point of contact with the plane of God, of the ideal of perfection, but the realization of your own worldview as a construct, like in the psychedelic experience. Okay, that's the first instance on how Kelly understands sorry, on how Kelly's materialist uh, aesthetics transforms the established categories. And uh, the notion of memory is also affected by this materialist transformation. All right, so um, what do I mean by this? 
So Kelly works very often around the concept of memory. It becomes his leitmotif from 1995 onwards, but it played a role before as well. And Francesca is going to address that. So with his works and his writings, Kelly critiques how we build historical as well as biographical narratives. So the idea is that we, still, we tell stories of our history according to an idealized version of what our culture should be. And in the same manner, we narrate our own biography according to an established ideal pattern. And whether it's history or biography, we repress or oppress any information that doesn't match that ideal story. So I explained this through Freud and Walter Benjamin's historical materialism. But Kelly addresses the idea of the constructedness of biography and history in texts like sublevel or introduction to a reconstructed history. So examples, once again, here you see the Statue of Liberty, very recognizable monument, which is glorious and represents some of the fundamental American ideals. And this is Kelly's version in which he's bringing that ideality back to the concrete plane of materiality. The eternal and universal goddess Liberty becomes a real woman with a real body. And very fast, this is the mobile homestead, which is a very complex project. But what I want to say for now is that it's a replica of uh, the house where Kelly grew up of his childhood home, which is built at the Mocad in Detroit and whose frontal part can be put on a trailer and travel. So he was addressing with this very complicated aspect of his own memory and biography. But what I want to say now is that one of the locations where he wanted to park his trailer was Greenfield Village part of the Henry Ford Museum where the homes of notable men such as Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers are replicated, as you see in the image. So parked here, the home of a normal blue collar Irish American family like the Kellys would be a vindication of the man on the street, which is the kind of people who never appear in the grandiose idealist accounts of history. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there, thank you. Okay, thanks, Laura. Uh, so now um, we'll go to Genevieve. Hello. Go set. Yeah. So I would like to thank uh, John Miller and uh, Laura Lopez Paniagua for inviting me to present my research on Michael is the Sublime. Uh, my PhD questions the contemporaneous contemporaneousness of the Sublime through the first in-depth analysis of Michael Isto's uh, series, The Sublime. The series is made up of about 40 paintings, two performances, as well as a group of photographs and published excerpts from the script of the performance. His series has been made between 83 and uh, 84. So I'll share just a PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, a research uh, directed by Jean-Philippe Antoine at the University of Paris, uh, Paris 8, and co-directed by uh, John Welshman um, from San Diego. Um, so the sublime is a tricky word whose um, definitions change over history from natural phenomena to the social processes of industrialization. Whereas the sublime was defined as a rhetorical issue in antiquity, it became an aesthetic issue in the visual arts in the 17th and 18th century. Although philosophers redefine its contemporary stakes through the technological sublime, nowadays in the artistic field, it is mainly considered to be old fashioned and a cliched concept. Hence, we can wonder why at the beginning of the 80s, uh, Mike Kelly did a series of paintings and performances entitled The Sublime while postmodernity was the main dominant issue being discussed at that time. Kelly's anachronic interest in the sublime aims at redefining its political stake. The sublime series comes back to the repressive violence exerted on inner psychology 
when ruling ideology is indoctrinated beneath consciousness. So here I'm referring to the French political philosopher Louis Althusser, who analyzed how a system of value can as well operate at the scales of the private and public spheres through education. But as for a definition of the sublime, Kelly more particularly referred to an 18th century philosopher, his name is Edmund Burke, and who observed that, quote, general words, uh, those belonging to virtue and vice, good and evil, especially, are taught before the particular modes of action. For the minds of children are so ductile that a nurse may give the disposition of the child a similar turn. When afterwards the several occurrences in life come to be applied to these words, a strange confusion of ideas and affection arise in the minds of many and contradiction between their notions and their actions. Kelly relates the confusions of ideas and beliefs to a process of identification described by a philosopher from antiquity, whose name is Longinus, and who conceived one of the earliest definition of the rhetorical sublime. Longinus stated that, quote, the true sublime uplifts our souls, just as though we had ourselves produced what we have heard, end of quote. Kelly interprets these effects as the approbation of, quote, ideas that one wouldn't normally accept as one's own, end of quote. The subjection to a public speech raises the question of how we recognize ourselves in an unfamiliar ideology. For Kelly, the sublime is hence related to issues of propaganda and social conflicts embedded in cultural forms. If the rhetorical stake of a discourse is more directly invested in the two performances of the sublime, the drawings of the series plays with the visual and textual languages of familiar iconography, styles, and discourse. Anonymous ideologies penetrate through common representations, which appear to be natural, universal, and timeless, and hence erase a sense of history. As we can see in this uh, picture, um, in this painting, the, the morning after, the monumental letters inscribed along the perspective of sunrise evoke the logo of the big film industry, 20th Century Fox, as well as the stone front of the Flintstones, a 60s cartoon setting up a prehistoric family. While the text evokes a difficult awakening, the black clouds in a murky sky announces uh, dark times. This collage of fictitious representations is nonetheless set up in a familiar landscape motif which characterized the sublime experience. According to the contemporary American philosopher W.G.T. Um, Mitchell, it should not be considered, quote, as an object to be seen or a text to be read, but as a process by which social and subjective identities are formed, end of quote. Therefore, Kelly identified signs of cultural alienation in the American iconography. While he was marked by the romantic paintings he saw at the Detroit Institute of the Arts, such as, for instance, this painting uh, by Frederick Edwin Church, um, instead of quoting directly uh, this wild exotic scenery as the main motif of the sublime paintings, uh, Keller reproduced what he called um, a bland mountain a landscape that I found on the cover of a jigsaw puzzle box, end of quote. The stereotype view of a touristic site, some of the works even so show sunshades on a terrace reappears in several works of this series, such as Bad Acting, which we have here, uh, The Sublime Framed, um, and Infinite Expansion, which we'll, I'll show later on. I haven't found the original picture uh, which he took back, uh, but we can assume that Keller suppressed, suppressed his colors and reduced its details. The title Bad acting suggests an ambiguous relationship between moral judgment and aesthetic evaluation. Therefore, we are not sure which object we should appreciate. Is it the behavior or the interpretation of an absent actor, or rather the two illustrations of an ordered and disorganized landscape that we should judge? The double window composition is framed by an outline which evokes the narrative structure of a comic strip. 
The reversed elements of a cottage, stump, and fir trees are floating as if they had been swept along by a tornado. Even the outlines of the mountain ridge have been redistributed. The caption is puzzling since it lacks context and address. Uh, I also have the, um, the, the I also found the recording of the performance uh, he did at uh, Harwells and it says, doesn't anyone ever interrupt your monologue? This sentence as well as the one below are drawn from the script of the performance. An overbearing comment states that, quote, the separated images have an unnatural tone, a clipped call and response. These fragmentary and paradoxical qualifications associate a bad acting to arti artistic artifices. Uh, artifice. But according to Burke, the sublime is actually provoked by a man, uh, quote, hurried out of itself by a crowd of great and confused images. For separate them and you lose so much of the greatness, end of quote. Burke locates um, a look, uh, quote, a sort of creative power in the order and manner in which they were received by the senses. Hans Kelle is really um, uh, careful at the associations operated by comparisons, uh, which can reinforce resemblance or underline differences. And Burke talks about that. Uh, he says, by making resemblances, we produce new images and we enlarge our stock. In making distinctions, we offer no food at all to the imagination, end of quote. So for Burke, uh, observing differences is then defined as a negative pleasure. We can understand Kelly's evocation of the picture taken from a jigsaw puzzle box as a model for the articulation of the Sublime series. We are also forced to question our own received ideas about what the Sublime is, as the title of the series is called The Sublime, um, and also the various forms it can take. Kelly explains that, uh, quote, through Burke I came to think of sublimity as a matter of framing. When an experience exceeds our frame of reference, we experience a sublime effect, end of quote. So the frame reference uh, takes a literal form in this uh, work, which is called the sublime, the sublime framed. Uh, and you can see the lateral expansion uh, of an identical landscape reproduced in diminishing sizes, as well as its increasing bigger frames deflate uh, the panoramic structure of the 19th century theatrical and optical conception uh, of the sublime, uh, which means grand scale, uh, which also became the cinematic and entertaining device of popular spectacle, uh, which is uh, here the panorama. The idealized conception of the sublime expanded um, the field of vision in wits as a metaphor of an appropriation of land. In Kelly's work, the control operated by the panoptical vision is broken by the display set in a corner of the room. Uh, debunking, well, here you have um, the nymphies, but uh, for instance, here you have this setting, whereas uh, at Halwells, uh, it was not in a room, it was really aligned on the wall, but then he displaced a bigger frame um, um, on, the, on the main um, uh, wall, close to the, um, to the door, actually. So um, he's debunking the purification of the visual field developed by, from modern landscape painting. Uh, and in this exhibition, you had in front of it um, the uh, uh, infinite expansion. Here it's at the, um, uh, and set at uh, Rosamond Felsen Gallery. Um, so they, are, they had the, the same size as the bigger frame um, of the Sublime Framed. But this one is standing out uh, from the other work of the series because uh, it's playing, it's performing an optical impact uh, through its psychedelic exuberance. The landscape uh, motif, which you can't see here because it's sm so small, it's like uh, nearly a, a stamp um, in the middle of it, but it's the same as we uh, saw in bad acting. It's being reproduced, uh, but it's lost here in the illustrative grain of the successive wooden frames, which from far away become psychedelic flames. 
and here it's also important to underline the, the, the physicality of the work uh, since it's composed of six sheets of paper of different dimensions which are superimposed in a telescopic composition uh, which disappears into the depths beyond the surface of the wooden frame. So here the expansion is not lateral but uh, in depth. But uh, here the potential infinity, however, ends up on the familiar uh, landscape uh, painting and it's not reaching an absolute end. Um, the display of each of the three historical exhibition of the sublime, um, I'm just putting back this one, uh, recombine in a different way the works of this series, uh, which means that they were not meant to be read as isolated pictures but as a signifying chain. For instance, here, um, I, don't, I don't know if you can see it here in the middle, uh, you have some uh, words, uh, which are actually part of this other work, which is called Timeline, uh, with a, a kind of family portrait in a, in a kind of pie, which is called actually family pie, father, mother, son, daughter, and smaller, um, in smaller letters, you have uh, egg and sperm. These words also echo part of the performance. Uh, so all the text is taken back from the performance script. Uh, in the painting, the composition takes the shape uh, of a circular diagram cut in unequal parts. Um, you also have this uh, motif of the family line, uh, which is uh, every, everyone is ordered by its size, uh, then uh, recalling the other structures we have seen. We can come back as a conclusion to Althusser who conceives ideology as, quote, an imaginary assemblage constituted by the day's residues from the concrete history of concrete material, end of quote. So while landscape has been an allegory of ideological and psychological uh, themes, Kelly comes back to the religious, moral, philosophical and uh, social ideas which were projected onto the American landscape. One of Kelly's reference, the art historian Barbara Novak observed that uh, an iconography of nationalism affirmed the myth of America as a great and powerful country. And we can see that uh, he's reversing this ideology. Um, I think I have to stop here, but I have, I could go on, <laughs> but I'll leave <laughs> some space to Francesca. So yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Genevieve. Um, so uh, next we'll go to Francesca. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I tried to share my screen first. Hello, everybody. And... Uh, okay. okay. Now you can, okay. And um, wait, I share first the screen. Okay, you see it. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you very much to everybody here and uh, Barnard College and John Miller and Laura Lopez like for hosting us and um, I'm very happy to join this uh, panel today. And um, I'm PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam. I'm Francesca Verga, and uh, for which uh, I'm pursuing uh, research on memory in the work of Mike Kelly, and especially in relation to his early performances and works uh, in the 70s and 80s, um, and following works as um, educational complex and uh, extracurricular activity projective reconstruction series. And um, I think like today, um, for me, it's important to outline a bit of background to understand Kelly's early work uh, around memory. Um, and we can say that um, Kelly first began performing uh, in 1970s uh, with his band, uh, Destroy All Monsters, uh, at the University of Michigan, and which he attended from 1972 to 1976. 
And Destroy All Monsters was a noise music band that was formed in 1973 by a group of artists and uh, musicians, including Jim Shaw, Kelly Niagara, and Kelly Laurent, and which used um, unconventional and um, improvisational instruments and sound and percussions and prim primitive electronics um, and guitars to um, tie sound with noise. And um, it, not, it did not like at the beginning attract much big audience, uh, according to Jim Shaw, like people like left the room when the band um, played uh, and they performed like in public few times uh, at the beginning. And in, it is in this context at the university that Kelly also started um, the first spoken text performances. Um, for example, there is a remarkable one that uh, today we don't know if it can be considered as one of the first performances or it's part more of his uh, musical band um, that is called um, uh, The Futurist Ballet and was done in 1973 uh, with Jim Shaw. And um, the performance happened just before forming uh, the band uh, Destroy All Monsters, and it played out in between music and performance, uh, including like pornographic readings, props, uh, writings, interviews, uh, noise music uh, produced with vacuum cleaners and other um, noises and voices. And um, so after uh, completing his studies at the University of Michigan in 1976, uh, Mike Kelly, uh, that was still part of uh, Destroy All Monsters, moved to Los Angeles to attend the California Institute of the Arts. And Kelly chose Collard um, because he wanted to study electronic music with um, the composer, uh, Morton Subotnik and take classes with Alan Capo and at all, although he, he basically left the school before um, Kelly entered. Um, and after the summer uh, of 1977, Kelly began to develop a series of performances that uh, were first seen in various um, classroom uh, CalArts um, and also at the Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibition of uh, LACE, uh, that, is, uh, that, that was this, is the space that hosted a lot of actions uh, at the time, also artists, uh, students. And um, the first performances um, used um, a lot of music and text mingled together uh, with strong repetition of words and beats uh, during the pieces. And they had um, a large component of noise music and garage electronic music. Um, they lasted about uh, one hour. Uh, in some cases, they were a bit longer. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind different things that the performance scripts um, were memorized by heart. And he noted everything that, Kelly noted everything that he wanted to say. So there was like um, a few spaces for uh, space for uh, improvisation. Um, and um, also like the performances were performed uh, just once or maybe two times if they was in New York and, and in Los Angeles. And this was because um, Kelly wanted to build also a belief system, performing it and making it once. Uh, as it as with site specific concerts, and um, Kelly also um, actively uh, prohibited the audio and video recording of um, his uh, performances. Um, so the performances was not recorded uh, nor documented um, in a way as with uh, many other performances. You you have to be there. So these are that you see are two um, different <laughs> invitations. And um, the material that is outlining the, 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 the performances is there for like constitutes of um, Kelly's own writings and manuscripts um, that are held by the McKelly Foundation for the Arts. 
um, and few transcripts uh, that are published in magazines uh, dedicated to performance, uh, like high performance, for example, or lace or or um, light works or um, spectacle. Um, and uh, also uh, props uh, used uh, during the performances and uh, also like extemporaneous like photographic documentations of the of the live events. Uh, so uh, the documentation was not given and there were like other there are now other type of documents. And um, another point of discussion of today is that the performances by Kelly that were done in 70s and 80s, you see already like points linked with memory and repetition that are done in later works uh, that uh, Laura mentioned. And, um, and so first we need to know that Kelly produced a set of performances that started also like with um, that deal with contemporary dance and started from music and dance. Um, and, um, and then there was this reiteration and duality of um, fast and slow movements of those actions and the repetition of movements become, became uh, central somehow in his work. Uh, like for example, here you see the, the pole dance that is a performance that was made originally in 1977, and then it was remade uh, 20 years uh, after by uh, Anita Pace. And um, the repetition of movements and words um, also confers a certain uh, lightness on Kelly's text. And this happens more within that with for example, Gertrude Stein's situation that was one of the writer and poets of the last century that inspired a lot um, Kelly, but in her writing, um, he talked a, a lot about that. And in her writing, the constant tone, you know, she repeats things over and over again and makes the words um, present and um, also the same, reinforcing the meaning in a way. And while with Kelly, when people do not remember past statements and um, repeated words, Kelly plays with it uh, by continuously also changing the meaning. Um, and so the scripts is therefore free to be uh, interpreted and um, remembering it becomes, it becomes um, subjective in a way. So um, the reconstruction through repetition is something that is um, always subject to revision uh, reversals um, for Kelly um, and not simply like copied in a sort of circular manner. And um, Kelly was uh, also interested in how the persistence of the past um, cast into traditions and rituals was treated and, and transformed in the present. Um, and this is something that you see, for example, in performances like um, The Parasite Lily, uh, the words you realized in 1980. Um, you see some of the pictures here. Um, and it's a, it's a significant uh, example of um, a performance that is touching issues on memory, uh, repetition, and comic uh, disposition. Um, although it was not video documented, indeed the performance it was not kept alive through props and photographs and the press release and scripts and notes. Um, and and the, the Parasit Lily was um, a 45 minute uh, performance that illustrated the protagonist's relationship with a plant. Uh, by using the manipulation of props and language. And Kelly performed uh, a monologue. Um, and uh, the, other, uh, the only other person involved in the scene was uh, a plant, the parasite Lily, that was his wife and lover. So the whole scene explores uh, a bit their separation. Um, and different sentences are re repeated at least twice in the text at different point um, of the monologue. And often like the same phrase was not repeated but rather subject to modification. Um, 
And um, another work, I um, don't know if I still have a bit of time, but the, the other work that um, I would like to mention in this regard is um, actually uh, the Banana Man. That was um, a sort of memorial act uh, because um, the piece originated as a script uh, first in 1981 and uh, later were transformed uh, into a performance and video-based project then of 28 minutes. And it was the first Kelly complete video work. Um, and the Banana Man is also a key transitional work from performance to video. Um, and in one sense, it's still a performance-related piece, but because it's scripted also in the same way of a performance. And um, so the, the Banana Man main character came from uh, Capitan Karangu, that is um, a well-known uh, children television program uh, that was from 55 to the 80s, 84. Um, and Kelly took the part of the Banana Man in the video, addressing like in total yellow and emulating his yellow words. And the, the, the script is actually uh, quite funny. Um, and um, so Kelly, a restaging of the character uh, of the Banana Man, uh, however, does not um, come from personal memories, uh, but is mediated by reports um, to the artist by his childhood friends. Um, they were telling him their memories um, about the Banana Man. It is based therefore not on first-hand memories, but on recollection on, of the events uh, by people in the art, artist uh, circle. And um, in Kelly's video, there is always this mix of personal and collective uh, memories. And uh, there is the, the remembrance of collective culture, uh, meaning and experience. So in this case, it's the Capitan Karangu and its character that are mingled together um, with personal memories uh, from others. Um, so what an individual remember, um, the personal memory is formed by the space of remembrance that is given by the social group or uh, to which she or he belongs. And um, through the excessive and sometimes really contradictory repetition, the work becomes often ab absurd a parody of um, certain actions and attitudes, but also a parody of itself. And at the same time, it affirms, but also like make fun of like the memories of how the audience actually fast, really fast forgets uh, past claims. Um, and um, that's all. I just wanted to outline that um, Kelly performances works for from the 70s and 80s reveals also like tensions and connections with some of the wider framework um, of memory studies uh, that Laura is analyzing in her book. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks Francesca. Okay, I'm going to just describe uh, a couple of works of Mike Kelly's. Uh, and the first is Educational Complex. Um, there we go. And uh, it, it's funny, um, by the time Mike made this work, I had known him for 18 years and um, he first showed it at Metro Pictures, the gallery where I, show as well and um you know went went to the opening saw the work and kind of assumed that i knew it um but in fact i really didn't start digging into it until i was invited uh to write about it several years ago and um uh, part of that is that there's um a whole kind of network of associations that aren't uh, necessarily imminent to the material form of the work itself. So um, I'm just gonna go over some of those. So uh, those of you who aren't familiar with Mike Kelly's work have uh, some kind of access point into this work. 
So what we're looking at uh, is a collection of architectural models that represent every school where Mike Kelly studied as well as his childhood home, which is on the lower right. And except for the California Institute of the Arts, which is uh, in the back, like over, can everybody see my cursor when I do that? Um, in, in the back over there, uh, all the other uh, buildings are uh, located in Michigan where Kelly uh, grew up. And he made this work in part to the response um, to his, uh, what was then his most famous series of works, the Arena series, and I'll skip ahead. Uh, yeah, Laura showed this already, but this is uh, from, uh, I forget the date. I think 87, uh, anyway, um, it's called arena number seven bears. Um, I like the way there's the two bears like sitting on a little strip of wood there. Um, but anyway, uh, Kelly claimed that uh, based on this work, people assumed that he was abused as a child. Uh, when I was like looking into writing my book, I could only find one reference to that in published criticism, uh, which was by David Riminelli, which was meant more as a joke uh, and, and a compliment actually coming from, given his perverse sensibility. Um, but I do remember uh, when Mike had his retrospective at uh, the Whitney Museum, I took my School of Visual Arts students to see it and afterwards, a lot of them said the same thing, that he was, they thought he was abused as a child. So um, that thought was out there. And um, it was interesting because in a way his audience was like projecting on him. And what he wanted to do was turn that around and, and project back on the audience. So what he claimed to be doing an educational complex, going the wrong way, um, was to uh, assume the role that was projected on him. And uh, the way he was going to do that was to try to reconstruct the floor plans of all the schools he attended and claiming um, those rooms that he couldn't remember were sites of abuse. And that claim was based uh, in part on, a, on uh, what some historians regard as like the, the third kind of um, national hysteria in US history. The first was the Salem witch trials. The second uh, was the um, uh, McCarthy so-called witch hunts. And it's interesting that the first uh, involved supposedly real witches and the second, the witches are metaphorical. Uh, and then in the third, um, sort of conspiracy theories that arose around daycare centers, which were um, emerging in the 80s as more women were uh, entering the workforce. And um, so they were connected to a sense of like social change uh, and they erupted most pointedly with the McMartin preschool case where uh, a whole community um, suddenly began to suspect the teachers and workers at this preschool of sexually abusing the children. And um, this case went to court. It was one of the longest running court cases in American history. And the prosecutors introduced a new uh, standard of evidence that was based on a kind of pseudo psychoanalytic notion of repressed memory syndrome. And um, the idea behind that was if someone couldn't remember an event, that this was proof of trauma. And of course, from the standpoint of a prosecutor, this was perfect because if someone does remember the evidence, you have it. But if they don't remember it, you have it too. So it was building up a kind of um, huge conspiratorial claim based on absence. So anyway, Kelly was claiming that uh, 
when he couldn't remember the floor plans of the school of all the schools he attended, and you know some of them were quite large and complex, then those were sites of abuse. Um, and as he was developing the models, he decided to um, leave parts of the roofs uncovered. And that kind of happened in the process of making this work because he realized in order to really drive the point home, viewers would have to be able to see the floor plans that he was reconstructing, although not all are visible. And uh, he worked on this with a number of years with um, architecture students. Uh, and it's funny, one time I visited him while the work was in progress and he was like very suspicious that uh, the students were padding their hours and kind of ripping them off because it was, it was taking much longer than he expected. But uh, later when I spoke to many of uh, the people who worked on this project with him, uh, they were working specifically because they admired his work and it wasn't just a job for them that they were um, actually invested in, in his aesthetic inquiry. Um, these are just shots of, there, there were claims that there were underground tunnels uh, below the uh, McMartin preschool. And then investigators actually tried to excavate the site in order to find these secret tunnels, which were never found. Um, and let me see how we're doing time-wise here. I'll just talk about these very briefly. Uh, this is a, a, a project that obliquely grows out of educational complex and it's called um, Extracurricular Activity Reconstructive Projection. And in these works, what Kelly did was he called um, different kinds of performances and events from high school yearbooks. And he would start with a source photo like this, then recreate the performance uh, or the image as closely as possible, then reimagine uh, the performance that this represented. But it was sort of like a interventionist reimagining where uh, he was turning these things into much wilder kind of events than they no doubt actually were. Uh, so that in, entitled, that entailed scripting, uh, writing music, uh, videotaping them. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that's going on here is looking at the photograph, uh, you know, that we assume that a photograph is like a memory aid or that it preserves memories. And through projection, he's, what he's doing in these is almost turning photographs into the opposite, like, a, like his recreation grants him the authority of objectivity, but then he's also kind of facetiously reimagining these things the way he would like them uh, to be, often with a, a perverse sense of humor. This is my favorite one, actually, because in the performance, the lonely vampire sings a song about this leather chair. Um, and um, one kind of culmination point uh, for these uh, reconstruction projections uh, was um, the exhibition Day is Done at Gagosian Gallery. So um, here we see uh, a number of these uh, reconstructions that include the set, the video, and the photographs. And this was actually a, a, a highly technically choreographed installation because it was set up so that the sound of two installations wouldn't overlap. So everything was controlled with a kind of macro computer program. Uh, although the viewer was unaware of that, you know, you would just kind of drift from one to another. And then um, this was also followed up with the film version of Day is Done and 
uh, several years later, a live performance at the Judson Church uh, in Manhattan, uh, which was also the site of um, the Judson Church dance group and a, a lot of um, minimalist era performance. So anyway, I just wanted to give a sampling of um, works around Mike Kelly's educational complex. So why don't we, um, Joan, should we take like a 10 minute break and then reconvene for a discussion? Sure, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so we have, it, it would be what, um, 112? So we, yeah, New York time, so we reconvene at 122. Okay, sounds good to me. Okay. Okay.
Hi. Hi. Do we have people back? I think Hi. people are starting to come back. Hey, Emily. Hi, guys. Nice to see you. OK. Hi. I was able to jump in about 20 minutes late. I had class, but it's lovely, okay. lovely to get all this. Thank you to all of the students. Well, thanks for coming. It's hard to tell if people are back or just uh, silenced. Uh, well, we're at, we're ten minutes now, so maybe um, maybe we'll just start back back up, uh, even as people are drifting in. Well, um, people are writing that they're back, so. Okay, okay, then we'll just jump right in. So, I thought perhaps one thing we could talk about is. Um, the role of language in Mike Kelly's work. And I think it's, it's one thing that binds together uh, materialism, memory, and the sublime, the, th the three kind of major themes that run throughout the inquiry that you three are conducting. And, and I think that that happens by way of surrealism. And, you know, we know that Mike Kelly's earliest work. Uh, in Mike Kelly's earliest work, language was central. Uh, you know, that the performances were scripted, he memorized them. His drawings derived from cartoons where there were legends and uh, adages. If one looks at um, the sense of materiality uh, in Bataille, in Bataille's sense of base materiality, it's it's basically matter invested with language, um, which, which I, I see is like a precedent for Robert Smithson, whose work for me resonates with Kelly's um, often at, at several different points. But, um, but what I mean by matter invested with language is that it, uh, it has to do both with you know, written and spoken language, but also social use. And when you know Bataille talks about material, he talks about homogeneous material and heterogeneous material. And the homogeneous is that which is functionalized, and the heterogeneous, which is what Bataille um, valorizes in a kind of inverse way, is that which uh, has no use value. And so it's something that just exists for its own sake that, you know, and that assumes a kind of ideal status in Bataille's notion of materiality. So these are kind of existential categories, uh, but it's not ma material as it exists empirically. Uh, it's material that exists within a social framework and uh, within, I would argue, a, a kind of linguistic system. Uh, and um, what else was I going to say? Uh, well, I, I suppose just you know thinking about um, about memory, uh, the influence of surrealism via Freud, and psychoanalysis as the talking cure, that somehow the, that this would uh, that analyzands would work through. A trauma through language, through recol through recollection, through articulation. Um, I think that these are some of the um, some of the points where language uh, brings all this together. And so, I'd be interested to hear what you may have to say about that. Oh, Genevieve, unmute. <laughs> Um, I, I can start maybe with that because uh, I think it's interesting that uh, Kelly goes back to a, an old theory of uh, Longinus who's talking about the rhetorical sublime uh, to say that uh, the sublime is an issue of propaganda and uh, even Burke also says that uh, words affect us more, more than the thing that they represent but also the words are sounds or the, the resonance and especially these big words, uh, which um, are, are really um, 
abstract in a sense, such as nation or country, or I don't mm -hmm. know, it's all these kind of uh, big values uh, which are over invested and uh, which are abstracted and which then are then subject to manipulation in one sense or another. So um, I think, yeah, it's interesting. I was surprised actually that uh, he comes back to rather the rhetorical sublime than the visual one in a sense to to say that its main uh, track to to approach the sublime in a sense so. yeah and and i guess he also said somewhere uh you guys may remember the source that uh, uh a concept like infinity only exists in language and thus it's a linguistic construct mm -hmm. and uh and that's that's very much like Smithson too, where Smithson says like the idea of a center can only be determined um, through language and there's no real center in the material world. But at, at the same time, I think that he's, uh, he's coming back to material um, and as Laura showed us also that he's coming to base material in a sense to uh, then reduce these words to concrete things that then be lose their uh, power in a sense when they're confronted to this material structure for instance in this series of the sublime the uh, the, the material is quite cheap it's uh, sheets of paper uh, I, I think in an interview you also told me that he it was also an economy in his work to to work with lower um, materials uh, he didn't have much economic means to to do his work so yeah, at that stage in his career, he was he was very pragmatic about what he could make and what you know. He always like had a good sense of um, what uh, you know what his resources were and and how to manage them. So at that point, he could do acrylic paintings on paper, roll them up in a tube, and you know take a whole exhibition with him as carry on luggage or something. Um, can I say something? Yes. Okay, yeah, so um, I wanted to say something uh, about, for example, uh, the the performance, the sublime, when he's talking about uh, Ajax. So the silence of Ajax is more sublime than any written word or something like that. So uh, I find it very interesting that uh, so many of his uh, works are built through rhetorical operations, you know, and uh, for example, the importance of Raymond Roussel in uh, the building of the structure of uh, extracurricular activity projective reconstruction. Okay, so this uh, is very abstract. So uh, basically he, he created systems of language in many cases to, uh, to build his works. So uh, in a video called Superman recites um, sections from the bell jar and other works of Sylvia Plath. So the element of the bell jar is uh, used in this uh, polysemic manner. So at the same time, alluding to the bell jar in the Superman mythology and uh, to Sylvia Plath's uh, Belger in her autobiographical novel. So I found that very interesting. And also, so there are also two other aspects of, of language which I find very interesting, uh, which are that, um, as you were saying, John, so uh, he affects a great critique of cultural narratives. And uh, in many ways, he's uh, breaking into pieces and reconstructing those cultural nar narratives within the, the symbolic order, within the symbolic system uh, to create that kind of institutional critique. And uh, third, so this wouldn't be uh, regarding his uh, artwork, but it would be regarding his writings. I think it's very important to say that he was such a prolific and fantastic writer. So uh, his, uh, written um, accounts of, of his own uh, work and his uh, criticism are absolutely amazing. So it's uh, also very, uh, very interesting, you know, when uh, artists are uh, 
writing, uh, it, it becomes an incredible document, like, for example, in the case of Kelly or of John or of Dali, you no. Know? So uh, that's also a very important use of language, in my view, in Kelly. Sorry. Um, no, I was just saying that in the performances is exactly like this. So he he could Kelly could be said okay to use tactics of repetitions in performances, but they become um, conscious method of destabilization through the use of language. So um, some performances turn on the ways in which Kelly performed through language. Um, and uh, so like language is totally like from the script, it started from there basically. And um, yeah, I just wanted to add this. Yeah, I, I think that um, I think that the presence of Roussel or the influence of Roussel is there from the very beginning in the performances. And if you, unfortunately, I don't read French, so uh, I I get the English language version of what Roussel's doing. But um, you know, one of the things that almost every uh, critical account of Roussel brings up is that um, he put his mature novels together by taking two sentences, changing one letter in the sentence that produced a completely different meaning and then knit the two sentences together as the beginning and end of the book through association. And Kelly's performance, textual strategies and performance are very much like that where he'll make one assertion early on, then just play with the audience's this capacity to retain that information and then say the opposite at, no. at a further point, which, which, you know, he attributes that also to Gertrude Stein and her use of repetition. But I think, I think Roussel is another precedent for that, for sure. Um, and, and also treating, I mean, there's another way to look at language and materiality too. Um, you know, from a kind of Roland Barthian vantage point where Barth looks at legalistic language as idealist language, where, you know, in a legal document, oftentimes terms will be stipulated that the property shall mean, and they'll give an exact address and, uh, you know, and this and only this, whereas poetic language uh, works by connotation and association. So it's, uh, there's like a transformative flux in uh, poetic language. Um, yeah. So in, in that regard, I, I think it's also important to mention, um, again, Dali's influence in uh, Kelly, uh, for example, with his uh, paranoia critical method which is an associal, uh, associational method that uh, Dali invented and that uh, Kelly took inspiration from in many of his works. Uh, and that is also very much related to language. Yeah, I think, I think both Dali and also William Burroughs uh, was quite important too. So, um, uh, you know, so with Burroughs, you get a kind of Americanized variant of surrealism, but um, yeah. But I mean also the- I mean, paranoia is paramount in Burroughs too. Yeah, sorry, Genevieve. Just to, to add to, um, for the performances, the sound and the rhythm is also very important. As Francesca said, it's not only a mnemonic way of uh, recalling the text because he was saying it uh, by memory, but also uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a rhythm in which we enter. And finally, we don't, we, we try, we, we tend to disconnect from the meaning and because we are lost anyway. So, so, so then it becomes a kind of um, sound material, um, kind of music in a sense. So. Yeah, yeah, like an incantation or something. He, uh, he played with that, that form uh, a lot actually. Yeah, I, I think also he, this uh, approach that he used, uh, so this method ba based on, on systems, what uh, you, Genevieve, were, was referring to, um, 
is also uh, a way of um, destroying meaning in a way. So just making meaning much less more important than, than form. So uh, if, if you look at many of the works, uh, it is actually the, the structure which takes uh, the importance and then you can look at meaning from another point of view. So without being in boot by, by meaning, without being submerged in meaning, which is you know how we live life normally. So with this kind of operations is the, the way in which through form, you can analyze meaning or you can see meaning in a critical way. Um, yeah, I can see that for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, also, also one thing I was thinking about relative to surrealism was, and, and this is a kind of tendency that uh, Kelly shares with Jim Shaw was to take um, also to, to take a threshold where surrealism becomes a cliche and to redeploy it as that. Um, so um, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but, but you mean you know, as a strategy of reappropriation re or you mean? Yeah, yeah. Like something, you know, like, like a deep perspective landscape, um, you know, which you see in Dali, like that then becomes like part of the vocabulary of surrealism. And, you know, very, and it's interesting because very early on, surrealism intersects with advertising, you know. So if you look back at old magazine ads, you know, you can see like a perfume ad that's using the tropes of surrealism almost contemporaneously with the production of surrealist images. Um, and so I, th I think that, uh, that Kelly and Jim Shaw both then see surrealism also as a part of like popular culture from that vantage point that it's, um, you know, so, and that, that I think is where it becomes like a real, a real break with um, say the aspirations of Andre Breton uh, you know, like a kind of rising above reality where um, the, the kind of cliches of surrealism become our reality in, in popular culture. And, and, and so then they're deployed like that. Um, yeah, uh, oh, so, oh, sorry, Francesca, go ahead. Uh, no, no, I was just uh, thinking on the relation with uh, falsehood uh, like indeed in that because like in the way like is you popular culture is used it seems indeed as as language no that if there is no matter of truth in that but it's just like reused to um create completely like new meanings and and something completely different laura did yeah, so um, yeah, uh, I was thinking about the, this importance of uh, surrealism for, for artists such as uh, Kelly or Jim Shaw. Uh, it's, well, surrealism is the uh, first art form to seriously engage with popular culture. And uh, this is something that uh, Dali was already doing in the, in the 30s which is also, I mean, and this is something which is uh, vindicated by, by Mike Kelly, because uh, for some, how for uh, in, in many American, North American accounts, it's as if uh, the use of popular culture uh, in art started with pop, when actually Dali was using it in the 1930s and also a very different kind of pop, sorry, a very different kind of use of popular culture. Because, uh, so for Warhol, for example, uh, the, the, those um, um, popular culture uh, elements were emptied of meaning. And uh, for Dali and other surrealists, uh, precisely the, these kind of popular culture elements that they use, are they're using it because they're imbued with meaning. So they're, uh, they're carriers of uh, cultural meaning. And that's the same way in which uh, it's being used by Kelly. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one can think of like Benjamin's Passagenwerk and the whole, you know, um, one of the things that motivated Benjamin to look at arcades was surrealism and, you know, artists like Max Ernst who were looking at um, uh, products that fell into the category of the just past that were no longer in vogue, uh, but were also not yet historicized, you know, so um, that was like a kind of terrain for surrealism to work with oftentimes iconographically. But for instance, um, regarding the picture generation, Kelly has a singular position in it. Well, the, in the 80s, there were many artists taking, uh, revisiting the main culture, uh, media culture. Um, then Kelly uh, questions this idea of, uh, of uh, one singular culture and, and rather um, says in an interview that he adopts rather a subculture cultural um, persona, for instance, regard, in regard to um, Cindy Sherman, for instance, or other persons who rather adopt a kind of media persona um, in their work. So I think it's also confronting the idea of uh, multiplicity of languages, which actually enter into conflict. Um, yeah, well, I mean, um... In the 80s, uh, one, of, one of the goals for some pictures generation artists was to cross over into popular, uh, popular culture, you know, so you have someone like Eric Bogosian, who was a performance artist who then becomes um, a, a, an actor on um, Law and Order, uh, you know, so he, he really crosses over or um, or Laurie Anderson, um, you know, achieves a hit record with uh, Oh Superman. You know, this was a goal of um, especially performance artists to uh, cross over. And there was like a sense that the art world was a sort of small, fake, artificial world and the popular culture was the real world. Um, so that was a kind of um, ideal. Uh, and then another thing, when you talk about how Mike Kelly distinguished himself, um, there was a, a kind of um, mythic sensibility that has to do with American exceptionalism that was still very present in the 80s that, um, that, that the US was a culture without social class differences. You know, so a lot of a lot of people, even friends of mine at that late point would say like, oh, well, you know, everyone's of the same class in the United States. And Mike Kelly very kind of vehemently asserted uh, a working class position, um, which later became, uh, you know, a point of tension as he became more successful and no longer working class, but, um, but that was definitely his, his point of entry uh, in terms of social critique. Should we um, maybe open it up? Uh, I know there's a, a lot of Mike Kelly experts in the audience as well as uh, our students. So maybe we should open it up just uh, to questions or comments from anyone in, in the audience. Anyone like to chime in? Just uh, unmute yourself if you like and speak up. Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> You're alone actually. <laughs> we have a shy audience. Oh, there's one. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> wait a a question is coming up to me in the chat, um, but I don't see the question yet. Um, I'll just wait for... Uh, let's see if this will work.
Okay. Um, coming from Piper Marshall, I'm curious how you would compare Kelly's work of the 80s with someone like Pope L, who was excluded per se from the pictures artist. Um, I have to confess, I'm not overly familiar with Pope L's work. I know a couple of projects. Um, I know nothing from the 80s, so it's hard for me to weigh in on that. Uh, anybody know, know more about him? Sorry, no. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Piper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, maybe one thing I could say, and this is like not based on depth knowledge of Pope Bell's work, but um, you know, it, the art world in New York was almost exclusively white until the early nineties when the so-called multicultural movement um, came to the fore. And by that, I mean, in terms of recognition, not in terms of who was an artist, of course, but just who was legitimated by the given system. Uh, let's put it that way. So um, in that sense, I would say the Pope L was like um, working with greater hurdles than Mike Kelly was. Um, Good afternoon. Um, this may be a basic, I'm a student at Barnard. This may okay. be a basic question um, and I'm hesitant to ask it, but I, I was wondering if you could speak more on the, the social commentary provided by Mike Kelly's work. Um, uh, it was- uh, What was the last part of what you said? Uh, if you could speak more on the social commentary provided by Mike Kelly's work or present in the work. I know you, everyone spoke extensively about um, influences and and ideologies that influenced his work but i'm so a little bit um i have a still a vague understanding of the specific or explicit social commentary in the works okay well i would say um it, it often takes the form of a, like a kind of a satirical mode or a facetious mode and also introducing um elements of so-called low culture in, um, you know, what would be regarded as a, you know, inappropriate format. And um, that was certainly part of his, his rhetoric, I would say, his rhetorical approach. And, and then also to, um, I think there was part of him that that tried to do something that was really poetic, um, but um, but then not presented as such. To present it as something vulgar, you know. So he he played with that, and um, I think Francesca showed what the announcement for med meditation on a can of burners, and and um, that was like one example by by pulling out something, Werner's was a, a it, it may still be produced, but it was a, a regional soft drink in the Midwest. Uh, and, you know, people didn't drink it on the East Coast or West Coast. So it was encoded in a way that uh, to, to treat this as like a quasi sublime object, even in the form of parody was a way to kind of um, exclude uh, the given cultural elites on the East and West Coast. Um, you know, so only people in the heartland of the US would recognize even what Kelly was referring to. Um, so that could be one, one example. Um, oftentimes his humor is quite direct though. So you, uh, and, and he was also inspired by, well, I was just thinking the other day, how much he was inspired by the British comedian Benny Hill, and um, and and he, I don't even know if those things are broadcast. I think you can find Benny Hill clips on YouTube, but um, 
but Benny Hill did a kind of skit comedy that that always had like very um, well, what Kelly called the lowest form of humor, you know, so like a butt joke or something like that, like just um, going for a cheap laugh. And but um, I, th I think that Mike tried to do the same in his work, uh, almost as like uh, as a means of a adopting a sort of facade or something that would play with viewers' expectations and the way in which his work might or might not be legitimated. Um, maybe you guys could weigh in on this too. Yeah, I'd like to say something. Um, yes, one thing that uh, I found very uh, interesting is um, a text called Myth Science in which he's talking about uh, the artist uh, Eivind Falstrom. I'm sorry, I don't know how you pronounce that. But um, yeah, there he's, he's reflecting uh, on one thing, which is that uh, the, there is an expectation of art to be uh, either formal or political. And uh, what he says is that he, uh, he does political art through form. No, so, uh, Kelly's uh, critique uh, is, mm, is not propaganda. It doesn't sound, uh, so his political statements are, are not direct. They're always done in a very subtle and very humorous way. So all this social commentary is done through, uh, through displacing elements. So he takes these elements for, from popular culture, he puts them in another uh, in another setting, so he changes the the order of things or of how we are used to to seeing them, and then you can make your own conclusions without him being telling you what you have to think. In a way, you now would you agree? Yeah, and, and I would say in that respect, uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree, and I would say in that respect, um, he was very influenced by John Sinclair. Uh, who was the manager of the MC5 and who wrote the book Guitar Army and who was uh, pretty much opposed to protests and rather said so rather than making protest art, uh, he wanted to make um, proletarian culture, which he also aligned at that time youth culture with, but this was back in the day when youth culture was seen as a kind of potentially revolutionary uh, cultural form. And maybe to add to that also, uh, Laura mentioned the figure of Ajax, which is at the same time a, a figure in literature, uh, a character in literature, uh, in an antique literature, but also uh, then a product used for the toilet uh, to clean things. And, uh, and there is- the for tub. Instance, Sorry? <laughs> Or the tub, or the sink. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and then um, he, uh, in the sublime, there is this uh, this character um, of the. Um, sorry, uh, he's he's enacting, uh, performing the janitor. There is this figure of the janitor coming over. So he's um, he's really um, playing this figure of the janitor. There is even on the cover of the Catholic Taste. Is, uh, where his, uh, there is a picture of him uh, incarnating this figure. So I think there is, uh, uh, yeah, as you say, an identification to this proletarian culture and also this lower status. Uh, yes. so oh, well, that, co that cover was even a kind of uh, Oedipalized reenactment because his, his father was a janitor that uh, actually worked in for the school system in um, not in Detroit, but I'm blanking out on the uh, town where Kelly grew up. Anyway, um. also like it, I may add also like the, um, the the domestic scene that he did this video performance that was the first um, uh, of the extracurricular activity projective reconstructions, and he took the, for example the photograph that he took from the yearbook. Uh, then he put it in another context and he reconstructed the story of the of the two men that were in the pictures um, in a sort of like love relationship like marked with paranoia and drama and 
it's it's a lot has to do with the repressed in the relationship and what you talked before uh, john of the uh, what happened uh, of, uh, at the San Martin preschool and I think like all this was like it's just like it's it's used in a way that um, then it gives um, a perspective um, at the all that um, yeah it's this is uh, super interesting how he used this I think we're probably coming up on... Uh... John, I just have a, a, a quick question, which is um, actually related to what Francesca was just speaking about, if I, if I may. Okay, I, I don't know who's talking, but um, it's, go it's ahead. It's John Beeson, hi. So yeah, hi, John. Uh, hey, um, I've been quite interested in your description in your book of educational complex as Kelly's foray into institutional critique. Um, you specifically discuss it as modeling a kind of paranoid center to institutional critique or a kind of paranoid version of it. And I was wondering if the panel has any comments on paranoia in Kelly's work or in relation to US culture and moral hysteria at the time. Well, uh, it, it, it's funny because, um, you know, a lot of that's connected to conspiracy theory. And one of the things that, um, interested Mike about conspiracy theory was that it's a belief system that it involves projection and that um, the projection uh, can potentially transform reality. And uh, so on the one hand, he, you know, in the case of educational complex, he, he chose the McMartin preschool case uh, because it was outlandish. But then if we look at more recent events like uh, Jeffrey Epstein, we see something that's true to life that was very close to McMartin or, um, you know, now the pandemic, uh, well, is giving rise to a lot of, um, I think, hyper paranoid conspiracy theories. Um, so, you know, we see that playing out in US politics, but also uh, here in Berlin, and even today, there was this report about um, uh, oil that was sprayed on um, artworks and artifacts in several museums. And um, uh, the reporters seem to be attributing it to, I hope I get the name right, uh, the celebrity vegan chef Attila Hillman, who um, is also kind of at the forefront of the um, extreme right COVID denier um, movement. And, you know, it speculates that uh, Angela Merkel is performing human sacrifices in the Pergamon and that there's a secret tunnel connecting her apartment to the museum. Um, but I, th I think that the way that was a little bit of a digression, but I, I think that um, uh, one way the paranoia works in, in, in Kelly's work is a kind of form of skepticism where I, I think he's in some ways feels that institutional critique can't reform institutions. I, I don't think that he's a reformist. I don't read reformist implications uh, out of out of his work in the same way I would say out of Andrea Fraser's work. Um, I'll let Laura jump in. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say that um, if I'm understanding you properly, uh, John, I, I think uh, paranoia would be very important because one of the things that he wanted to uh, do with uh, his work as, as a project as a whole was to represent the mythos of his culture, which he considered to be victim culture. So he termed the culture that he was living in as victim culture. And of course, this victim culture has a, a lot to do with uh, narratives that were very important at that time, like the repressed memory syndrome, etc. So several, uh, let's say, uh, excuses 
uh, as John said in his presentation, that uh, allowed people to consider themselves victims. You know, so there there was this whole sense of paranoia, which was also uh, um, a historical uh, event in in a way because uh, of course it's. Uh, a time in which in the US, so for example, women have joined the workforce and they have to leave their children with uh, other people. So there, there's a lot, of, so for example, this whole uh, childhood abuse scandals and so on uh, are uh, in, in a way, they're uh, partly a consequence of, uh, of that historical fact, but there were many, you know, so uh, they, uh, the U.S. was coming from the serial murderers of uh, the 70s and 80s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, there was a great sense of paranoia, and of course that was paralleled with uh, the alien abduction um, phenomena that were also being reported since the 50s, and that became a whole uh, a whole phenomenon uh, later. Uh, exemplified, for example, in the uh, success of the X Files and things like that in the 90s. Yeah, also, you know, I think that there's an explicitly um, political dimension to this where conspiracy theory emerges uh, at a certain stage in the public sphere when, um, you know, you have the press and, and also with the emergence of uh, democracy where um, you know, a democratic government purports to represent everyone, but instead represents the majority. You know, so that's different. So that, that there's, um, so there's always a, a component uh, of the you know, popular demographic that uh, is in some way excluded and resentful and um, and then um, yeah, I, I can't articulate so well like how how the press functions and the media function in the public sphere. But then there you know it starts to create like a kind of underside to that though, and um, it, it, it's it's connected to um, media and mediation and a, and a kind of consensus notion of reality within liberal democracies. You know, that's, I think part of what, part, part of the terms that he's addressing with that. Um, yeah, and, and uh, also like the trauma was then mirrored in, funny enough as Kelly's trauma and projected in his own uh, biography when he was doing the stuffed animals and that the all um, reception uh, always tended to be about nostalgia and trauma and um, and, and and the reception of his work. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're running a little bit over now. Um, that, does anybody have any like concluding remarks or um, should we end with like the In question of institutional critique vis-a-vis -vis Kelly. Okay, well, thank you all for taking part in this. Thanks for everyone who, who joined us via Zoom. And uh, Joan, thanks for hosting our panel this evening. And um, Joan, do you want to say anything to the class before we? Uh, no, I, I've already messaged them. I will see them next week. It's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.